Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome back to the WinWire discussion with Dr. Adam Pace on AI ontology for health data sciences. This is our flash talk number two. Uh, Dr. Adam, welcome back. Thank you very much. So uh, last time we talked a lot about, um, you know, what are the different types of AI, you know, the impact of AI in healthcare. And this time we're going to focus a little bit more on health uh, data sciences, you know, the whole data management aspect. So what do you think, how can AI help in this scenario? Well, I think a lot of the focus today in data science is uh, quite rightly on statistical methods. Um, but the challenge with statistical methods is that you need good source data. Uh, and very rarely do we have the, the ideal case of a single well-known database that the data scientist was involved in its creation. Uh, it's more often that we need to integrate several databases that probably were not created by the data scientist where the full semantics of the data may not be e even known or it's certainly not clear. Um, and a lot of time has to be spent in uh, understanding what's there understanding what uh, the good data is and where there might be uh, some bad data that needs to be scrubbed. And, and this can be a complex process that seems to consume the bulk of the time of most data scientists in practice today. You're right. Uh, data scientists do seem to spend a lot of time correcting data and figuring out how to combine all these data sets together. Do you uh, feel that this, uh, you know, the, it's the data scientist's job there? Well, it has to be somebody's job, and, and data scientist is the one who seems to get stuck with this in practice. Um, and uh, we'd like to find a way to make this problem a little bit easier. Um, ultimately, I think it is a, a manual process. Some human really has to understand the intended meaning of different fields. But to the extent that we can add some automation that will help with this problem, we could really save people a lot of time. Yeah. You know, I, I believe uh, today a lot of the data science scientists, even AI engineers, they're spending maybe 75 to 80 percent of their time, you know, cleaning up or trying to sort through data and get the right training data for their uh, different AI exercises. Can you give an example in your context for patient information? Yeah, so let's just take a very simple uh, example, maybe of some uh, pac patient personal information. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the risk factors uh, for today's uh, horrible coronavirus epidemic is issues like uh, family size. People living in large multi-generational households are, have a lot more exposure, and so that could be a risk factor that's really important to capture. So let's say we have a couple of uh, databases that might have patient information uh, that we're looking at doing some analysis on. And we might have one, let's say, that uh, includes the patient in the count of family size, and the other doesn't, even though they both label the field as family size. Now, the, the sad fact is, although we'd like to think that everything is going to be well documented, that's rarely the case. Usually, you're going to get a, data, a database that has uh, maybe even no, no metadata whatsoever, or at best, at least some brief comments. So how do you know whether, in fact, uh, the intended meaning was inclusive of the patient, him or herself, or not? Uh, it's going to take some analysis, right? So at least in this case, you could see, does, does one include uh, cases where the value is zero? So that would tell you uh, that the, the patient himself, herself, is not included in that count. Okay, great. So the, the data scientist can go in there, can add a note, add a definition, uh, and move on with, with the analysis uh, once he knows that to combine the two, it's going to need to add, add one to the database that doesn't count the patient uh, when merging this data together. But okay, that's one simple issue. Great, he solves that issue. Now a third database comes in and maybe it has a completely different arrangement. I mean, maybe uh, another database has included uh, roommates or housemates, people that are not uh, family relations in that count. So how do you combine the two? And, and worse yet, how do you even know that that's a problem, right? So. Uh, Yes, the data scientists today can uh, write some special purpose code, write uh, hacks essentially into his or her scripts that will do these combinations. But the problem is documenting this stuff 
uh, so that it's known and and documenting things that are only going to be known to be an issue when they arise in the future. So uh, no programmer will ever be able to anticipate what all these issues are right from scratch. We need to have some way to have a, a library or some background material that automatically uh, supports these decisions and clarifies them so that uh, everybody's not having to, to think about or imagine what these issues in the future might be uh, right, from, right from scratch every time they do this kind of a job. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. So is there a solution in the market? Is there a solution approach to this that we need to think about? Yeah, I mean, first we can just say in general terms, I'd say uh, continue obviously using statistics to find potential issues. If there isn't documentation, you've got to find, have some way to alert you that there's, there's a problem or an incompatibility. So use statistics to find outliers and different distributions and, and identify that there might be a problem. But we have the facilities of logic mathematical logic and computable logical languages that will allow us to document uh, the definitions uh, for the future. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's so important to think of this in the right way and have a balanced approach. Uh, how would this specific thing work in ontology in your example? Yeah, so there, there are really two absolute requirements. And if you don't have these requirements met, this is a, a problem that's just too big to solve. And I think a lot of people don't know that there are solutions uh, for, the, for these sort of two main issues that enables this approach, because it's always seemed to a lot of people to be sort of just too hard uh, to do in a formal manner. And the really the two keys are, one, having a, a, a representation language that's very expressive. So we use English for documenting our metadata or some other uh, human language because we can say everything that we want to say. Anything we can think of that's true about uh, a definition for our data is, is expressible in our human languages. Um, but nowadays we do actually have uh, computable mathematical languages that can also allow us to express everything we'd want to express. And that's key. If you can't say everything you want to say, then you're leaving stuff out. You're leaving things implicit and you've lost an opportunity to, to document things and document them in a way the computer can handle. The second requirement is that in that expressive language, you have to have said a lot of things. You know, if your dictionary is only one page, it's not very useful. You need uh, not only a language in which to express this dictionary, you need to have a big dictionary in hand so you're not redefining the entire world from scratch because that's an, an impossible problem. Hmm. Well, you've been working for a number of years, maybe decades on Sumo, right? Uh, does Sumo have an ontology library that addresses this? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it, it has been a remarkably two decades uh, that I've been compiling this uh, dictionary. It's all open source. It's defined in a very expressive mathematical language. So there isn't anything that we want to say in English or in Hindi or German or any other language that is impossible to say in the mathematical representation. Uh, and we've got a really big dictionary of tens of thousands of concepts. That means we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, if we're in a particular domain, we can just reuse all of this content and extend it just in the same way that programmers reuse big libraries and extend them rather than writing every last line of their program they deliver from scratch. Well, that is uh, very informative and useful. Uh, we will continue this discussion in the next talk. Thank you for your time, appreciate it. Let's see if uh, we can go into further details on ontology in the next talk. Thank you, Dr. Adam, appreciate your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Great. Thank you.